Do you remember what that early church did? Their heart, passions lie. Our heart is speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit. The theme of, of, of our series is with joy. And I, I love this, and I need this reminder all the time, that a joyful heart is good medicine. A joyful heart is good medicine. But where does the joy come from? And that's kind of where, where we are on this theme of, of Philippians, to do things with joy. Today it's just titled Experiencing Joy. I think some of us have a hard time experiencing joy because we're too busy experiencing pain or frustration or anger. Maybe you suffer with depression. It's not to limit all of these things. These are serious issues and I, I don't want to minimize them. Sometimes it's self-inflicted. We just aren't happy. The theme isn't about happiness though. It's, it's about experiencing joy and a joy that only comes through Christ. And today as we go through Philippians, um, we're going to be in chapter 3, the first 11 verses. I want to give us something that will feed into to this. How many of you had aspirations to do something grand with your life? Please tell me everybody has this. You should. Some of us have made it to what we had dreamed of doing. Some of us, uh, maybe we grew up and realized that that job wasn't all it was cracked up to me. I don't know. When I was little, uh, really young, my aspirations were I wanted to fly airplanes. But not any airplanes. I thought it would be cool to fly jets. I didn't realize that all the other stuff that came with that. There was no other reason other than I think I've watched a lot of G.I. Joe. And I was like, that looks cool. I even have my own little cartoon caricature, caricature from Great America. You know, they draw your face and they put me in an airplane. And I think it was when Top Gun came out. It said Top Gun on the side. I don't know if I was Goose or Iceman, I hope not, or uh, Maverick, whatever. Uh, I wanted to fly planes. That lasted until I started playing sports. Planes went out the window. And all I wanted to do was be a professional athlete. Anybody? Anybody? Nobody, just me? Only guy? <laughs> Only guy that wants to do that? It, it sucked up my life. Really did. Um, I started playing soccer when I was like six years old, and I loved it. All the other sports were good, but soccer had my heart, and I loved it. Um, when I got into sixth grade, I started playing travel. This was new. You got to realize soccer really hit the map here in 94 when the World Cup came, but I think Jeff, John, and I started in 88. Um, so we were like trailblazers, you know, for this. I probably not. But but we played a lot, and it, it was like uh, life for us. And um, I played competitive. We traveled all over the West Coast, as far down as San Diego. We played games in Portland. We just traveled a lot. We played this game that we loved, and I thought, this could be my thing forever. I could do this. Um, and I started trying my best to pile up my own accolades, right, to, to plead my case. Um, so, you know, we won tournaments or we did different things. I'd go to different training camps or uh, I got to try out for the Olympic development team. It's not all it's kind of that it's political, but all these things. I just started checking all my lists, all my lists, all the things that made me like, this is it. But I had a mom who was smarter than me and she was a humbler of sorts, not to tell us that we weren't good, but she actually promoted us. You should try this. You should do all this. But what she didn't allow us to do was to put it over our connection with, with God. I didn't know this. Didn't know this is what she was doing. But every turn that we went to, she found a church for us to go to before our games. And if our games were early, guess where we were at Sunday night? <laughs> Sitting in the back row listening to Don Kern. I don't know how much I listened, but I was there, right? And this was her hope and her her push for us, then no matter whatever your accolades are going to be, whatever you desire to be, if you don't have a connection with Christ, it doesn't mean anything. This is the lesson that we got to learn. And I think it's a lesson that I'm hoping to present to my own children that you may be the best at something that you think, but if you're not the best in your relationship with Christ, then all of that means nothing. It took Paul a long time to figure this out because he thought he was serving God and he thought what he was doing was to promote what God was putting on his heart. But what it was really doing was adding up all the accolades that he could get to make himself feel like he was accomplishing something. That he was living up to his dreams of what he wanted to become. But it wasn't truly connected with the gift that, that God had for him because he was ignoring the most important piece 
Not only was he, he wasn't really ignoring it, he was highlighting it and persecuting it. And we do this, and I want us to know, when we aren't really experiencing the joy of Christ, you will feel it because you will feel the absence of him in your life. It's not a joy that brings happiness. It's a joy that brings peace and contentment. It's a joy that when life is out of whack, you are still grounded and stable because you know who you belong to and you know where you're going. So in all things, I want to promote to you. Dream big. Think that you can do all the things. But have a grounding of knowing who you do it for. So with that, and not only did my mom have this smartness, she imparted that wisdom onto my oldest brother. Because the summer in between my junior and senior year of high school, I was asked to, uh, I was recommended by the coach of Cal Poly to go there and use the camp as a tryout. To go into San Diego State and to use that visit as a whatever. And my brother said, I don't think this would be good for him. So I'm going to ask him to live with me for the summer and give him a job at Pepperdine. Maybe I can make him see the light. I don't know. It doesn't take much for a 17 year old boy to see the light and walking around Pepperdine campus <laughs> when they had an international student summer school for all the tennis players. I'll let your imagination talk. Um, but it was a grounding thing. I got involved in the church during the time I was there. I got to meet the campus ministers. I really fell in love with the grounding of a Christian environment because guess what? My mom made us have that. I knew it. As much as sometimes I was like, why are we doing this? Later I go, I'm so thankful you did that. Because my my priorities were never too far out of whack. And when I felt my life slipping, I knew where home base was. And I want us to think about where your home base is today, because if your home base isn't solid, you are not going to experience the fullness of the joy that Christ has for you. You just won't. It'll always feel turbulent. You'll always find reasons for something to complain about, to get hurt about, all these things, but when our home base is solid, our hurts don't stick because we know who we belong to. We know who we are, and we know who we're connected to. And we know that the body is one, and it's solid. And regardless of the of, of what Satan tries to do to crack us apart, we know that it won't last because we are solid in our foundation and our relationship. So, let's listen to the words of Paul. We're going to go back and talk about some things, but he tells us over and over again in Philippians to rejoice. And usually he's telling us to rejoice when things aren't even great. He's writing this letter in prison. Many of you here probably have not been there. I think during this time it was worse than it is now. They didn't get all the free meals and the, the looping of Judge Judy or whatever is playing in the TV. They got to sit there with shackles on where they couldn't move. And they sat on cold, wet floors. And they sat in their own everything that's gross in the world. And they lived in that. Regardless of what you were in there for, you were still treated as the worst because you were a criminal. So, in all of the muck, in all of the gross things, Paul writes a letter that is bubbling over with joy to his people because he's proud of them. Because he wants them to continue to fight this fight of the good news to hold on to it, to be bold, even against those who are preaching a gospel that is against everything that he's shown them. Hold true to what God calls us to do, to love each other, to serve Christ alone, for he's the only way to enter the kingdom of heaven and to the Father. So he says this, whatever happens, dear brothers and sisters, <clears throat> pretend this is to you. Whatever happens, dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Never get tired of telling you these things. And I do it to safeguard your faith. Whatever the situations come in your life, whatever you are facing, we can look at it with a confident joy because we know where our hope is. Whatever comes your way, I need you to rejoice in the Lord. Well, John, for those, now this is where he gets a little personal. Okay. We're going to talk about this. Watch out for those dogs those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. There's always people who want to put in some heavy things that we can never live up to. The Jews had a generation, not just like a few decades, not a hundred years, 
thousands of years of the right way to serve God. It's the only way to do it. Christ comes and turns them up on their heads and says, that's not, that's not it. I'm going to fulfill all of that through you on the cross. And take your sins. On the third day, I'm going to rise from the dead. This is it. This is the fulfillment. But you know it's really difficult when you carry that heavy of a tradition, even if you say, even if you say I believe that. We still bring in our old stuff because we want to say it wasn't in vain. The last thousands of years is how we did it. You need to do like us. So Jesus, yes, law too. Law says be circumcised. Look like us, and then you're truly saved. And Paul was not having it. And of all the people who should have been on board for this, it would be Paul, right? Because Paul says this. He goes, we put no confidence in human effort. Though I could, I like Paul. He's a bold guy. Confident. Though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could. Indeed, if others have a reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I think he whispers losers after that. I don't know. Uh, I do all these things, right? I was circumcised when I was eight days old, and I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel from the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew, if there ever was one. This is a different translation if you don't know this right now. He would say, I'm Hebrew of Hebrews, right? A member of the tribe of Benjamin. A real Hebrew, if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience of the Jewish law. Do you see what he's doing? We just talked about this. I'm checking all of these. I have raised my own bar. If I was keeping a tally mark of all the great things that I've ever done, I look really good. He's only keeping records of the great things. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without a fault. Some of them say, according to the law, I was perfect. So some translations say, I asked, does the scripture say that anybody could be perfect according to the law? He'd say, no. The law was made so we could know how far away from God that we've come. This is what we know. But according to Paul, in the life that he lived as a Pharisee, he thought everything he did was perfect. He thought what he was doing to serve the church and to serve God was above everything else. I don't know about you, but it doesn't look like loving your neighbors as yourself by persecuting, watching one of them get stoned, going in and throwing men and women and children into prison, not only in Jerusalem, but you say, I'm going to take it even further. And he goes before the leaders and he says, can I go to Damascus? I'm going to snuff this out. These Christians are done. And on his way, Jesus has a different plan for him. And this is why I say, no matter what you do on your own, even if you think it's serving God, but there is no connection to God in it. It's mainly for your own selfish gain. Because guess what? Paul loved this look. How many of you remember the story, Stephen? If you don't, know I'll give you the clip note version because I don't want anybody to be lost. Stephen was the first world martyr for, for Christianity. Stephen just gets chosen as one of these seven new guys to come in. And he's sitting there. And he starts professing this Jesus, this good news. Pharisees didn't like it. And they pull him before everybody else. They got stones in hand. And you know what they come to for approval? Saul. And Saul goes, go ahead. And they stone him. And he sits there and he just gives this amazing sermon. If you ever want to just read an amazing sermon, read Stephen's like testament before he gets stoned. His witness is incredible. And he looks up, he he thinks he sees Christ and heaven opening. And they really didn't like that. And they start yelling things and coming to you. And, stuff like that. and Saul is there. I don't know about you, but you've got to have some kind of authority if people come to you and say, is it okay if we kill this guy? According to the law, is this, is this good? Are we clear? Is this okay? The same people who would drag a woman out of an act of adultery, the guy never shows up. They grab the woman out and throw him before Jesus. All right. What do we do with this? They're trying to test him on his knowledge of the law. What does the law say? What should we do? She, should, she deserves to die. She was caught. And Jesus, over and over again, offers this amazing grace. He sits there and he lets them know, well, whoever is without sin, throw that stone. This is Jesus. Paul says, yep, didn't follow the rules. Take them out. Done. Broke the rules. Some of those rules we created ourselves that weren't even part of the law, because that's what the Pharisees did. They had to pretend it was. We don't know anything about creating laws, though. As Christians, we do this sometimes, too. We do. But what he was saying in this moment 
I was everything that was perfect according to this way. If anybody can boast, I could do it. I had all of the things. My mom's house has trophies <laughs> around the room with how good of a Pharisee tribe of Benjamin Jew I was. Got all the green ribbons. Blue ribbons? Green is for this day? I don't know these things. Got all the good things in there. But this is how he comes to it at the end. We have no confidence in what we can do on our own. I thought these things were valuable, but I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. No matter how great we could be, no matter what we could do on our own, it is nothing. He even says it's garbage without Christ. Everything else is worthless when it compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else, continuing it all as, counting it all as what? Garbage. That I could gain Christ. I would lose everything if I could find Christ. This is valuable words from a man who's in prison. Because he did lose everything. He put his life on the line, traveled, they say something like 10,000 miles to get this message of Jesus out to the world. That they may know the message of good news. All the other accolades, everything I could boast in, no matter what it was, is trash if it isn't for Christ. Are we there? Would you be willing to lose it all? It's hard. We talked about this earlier in our class. We are a very privileged society. We don't know what it's like to not have things. We take a lot for granted. We don't know what it's like to not be without drinking water. We get mad when the water pressure isn't good enough. We get so mad when our food isn't done quickly that we even get mad at the microwave for taking too long. Think about it. We go into our air-conditioned buildings and we complain that it's too cold on a 100 degree day. When there's not enough of the food that we like before church, we might complain too that there's so much food that we couldn't eat it all. We don't know what it's like to not have the things. We take so much for granted that we can't find joy in little things anymore. I don't want to say we can't. We can't. We just overlook them. We don't know what it's like to not have shoes on our feet, to have socks, to have a house with a roof on it that doesn't blow away when the wind picks up. Some of us have experienced loss lately, and we know what it's like now to lose some things, and how hard that is and what we have to endure. But you know what we have? Insurance. That we know it'll get rebuilt. Most of us, not everybody. It's hard to sell hope to people who don't know what it's like to not have hope in themselves. Because they think we can do it all because everything has been handed to us on a plate. At night you go home and you lay on a bed. Most of you have nice pillows. And we wake up and complain that our backs hurt. Most of us have jobs, or had jobs, you might have had a job that was so good that you get paid to not even work anymore. And some of us go to work every day and complain because we have to go to work. That pays your bills and allows you to have this life. Do you see what I'm saying? I keep going, right? We've turned what should be immense joy into complete and utter complaint. I do this. I'm guilty. This is a finger pointed at me. I'll say things like, I don't like this car. It gets me from one place to another, though. And I can find a reason to get a different one. <clears throat> so much. I like what Bruce brought up. When we moved to this building, he said, oh man, I just, it's too far away. 20 minutes is too far. And we started talking about places we've been overseas where people walk an hour or have to take two different trains to get to church because they're so invested in this hope message of Jesus. And we go, oh. 20 minutes in my really cushy car listening to my good Christian music. It's hard. It's hard for us to find joy when the world has made you think that you are not enough, that your situation is not enough, that your circumstances aren't enough, that you compare everything to everybody else around you and you don't measure up or whatever it is, I don't know. Satan is good and he made us apathetic, complacent. 
We've lost the drive to serve a God who forgave us of all the things that are wrong within us before we even knew we were doing them and would nail them to a cross so that we could have life and we still look at it and say, but why did you let this happen? Why did you do this? Christ, I don't know if you're good enough because I still have these problems. And we forget that his grace is sufficient, that his power is made so strong in our weakness. And even sitting in a jail cell, we can have this amazing hope that this isn't the end, but I'm here. And even when I'm here, the name of Jesus can be professed to so much more and can spread so much further, even in my chains. So even though he's saying, I had all these things, it was nothing if it wasn't for this goodness of Jesus. I'm going to finish this verse and I'm going to go back to the beginning. Paul writes a lot of run-on sentences there. Well, for this sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Underline it. Rather, I become righteous through what? Faith. Faith in what? Faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. There's a song that we do. Bruce has inspired me today. His energy was great. We sang two songs with Bruce. He's going to join the praise team soon. There's, there's this, I don't know if anybody else does this. There's this trick to learning that people have made us do, and, and especially in Bible school when you're a kid. I don't know if they still do this. They should. I'll read scripture and go, I can't read that without singing this, this line of the song. We grew up singing this uh, this this as a song uh, and reading it in full context makes the song so much more powerful you don't have to know the song I'm going to sing it though Bruce inspired me <laughs> to do so and if you know it it's cool this version doesn't match up with the song so don't look at these words for for like your words but the song is I want to know Christ and the power of his rising share in his suffering Born to his death, when I pour out my life to be filled with the Spirit, joy follows suffering and life follows death. It's amazing, right? We learn these things through song. We don't know that we're memorizing scripture, but we have them in our hearts, right? I want to know Christ. I want to experience that mighty power that raised him from the dead. You want that in your life? This power of the Spirit that raises Christ from the dead lives in you, but we've been squishing it so much that it's barely hanging on. It's like a flicker of a flame when it wants to catch wildfire in your heart. And it wants to move you to do so much with your life that you haven't allowed it to do. Because you're too worried about yourself. I say you. I can, I can. We. Sometimes, I'll just point it. I'm too worried about me. <coughs> How many of you have planned your day out before the day even got started and you're already stressed out? I gotta get up, I gotta do these things, I gotta go here, I gotta go to work, and then I get home from work, maybe I have enough time to eat, and if I don't, I gotta stop somewhere on the way home, and I gotta pick up the kids, and I gotta hope that they are not awful at school. And then I gotta get home, and I gotta make sure they do their, their homework. These teachers with the homework, they gotta read for 20 minutes? Oh, I have to read with them. I hope they can just learn to read on their own. <laughs> we are so stressed out that we don't take a pause and to be still and to know that he's God. The creator of everything, the creator of you, has great plans for you. Take a pause in your life. Smell the roses. Look at the trees. Invest in the family that you were blessed with. I am super guilty of this. My kids want all my time and I love them. Every once in a while, I need a break from them, and I'll get snippy. And I need to say, you know, they love being with their dad. I need to love being with my children. And I do, majority of the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I know the value of this because I lost my when I was young, too. And I want them to have every memory they need with their dad. But a memory of just me is nothing if it's not connected to the bigger dad of God. And children will do things that will help you to understand how good God is and give you joy. I shared this little story in, in our class, and I think you all need to hear it. 
Sometimes people think that if you're not baptized, you don't believe in God yet. I got to challenge you because I have a story. We were sitting around the table eating dinner and just made it. Have you sat down yet? Giving all the kids their food. Renee's sitting down. Kaya's eyes get really big. And she goes, oh, we forgot. And I was like, did I forget your drink? Did I forget your fork? We forgot to pray. Okay. Eyes got all big. And they go, we did forget to pray, Kaya. You want to pray? She prayed over her family. But this is the best part. She prayed for her meal. She prayed for our everything. Is, Thank you for my family. And she did every one of us. My mommy, my daddy, my grace said, I'm like that. And then she did it again. And then she prayed for the food. She said, Amen. But she didn't let it in there. All right, Grayson, it's your turn. <laughs> and Grayson prayed. All right, all right, mommy, it's your turn. Mommy prayed. All right, daddy, it's your turn. Daddy prayed. It slowed us down, it showed us Christ in its most purest form. And I sat there with a tear in my face. I tried to wipe it away. You manly guy. I sat there and was just like, that's awesome. We did something here. It had nothing to do with us. God used her to reconnect us with him. To show us our grounding. You have food on the table. You're running. You're not looking at each other. You're busy. Slow down. Connect with me. Connect with each other. This is more about what life is about that God calls us to than any amount of Bible you can read, any amount of rules you can follow. God calls us to be connected with Him, with everything we have, and to be connected with each other with that same love. This is the greatest commandment we've ever been given. If, it, if you don't leave here, if anything other than this, I thought I'd never say that. This is my stepdad's line of every sermon he's ever done. He's been preaching for 40 years. If you don't hear anything today, hear this. Slow down. The faster you run in this life, the less joy you're going to have in it. Because you're not experiencing all the goodness that God has for you. I was out of training. Uh, we're going to end with this. I was out of training about how these, these devices are, are evil. <laughs> Um, our phones make us uh, in our screen time and all this stuff with kids but adults too it messes with our minds it makes us anxious it affects our depression um, it takes away from like this joy that we have sometimes and this is what they came up with so I'm going to give you this your executive functioning is, is firing at all times because we're in this fight or flight mode without knowing it a lot uh, if you don't know what that is it just means you're ready to either run away or stand up and fight something uh, if you've ever been that real experience, you know what that feels like. Your heart starts racing, your, your breath starts getting short, and you're trying to figure out what you need to do. Our executive functioning is firing so hard because we're looking for escape routes. We're looking for what we're going to do. And we never really turn it off because we're, we're too ramped up. We've got too much on our minds. We've got too many things going on. We don't want to miss out on something. Uh, we, we don't like it when we look on, on social media and all of our friends did something. We weren't there. We freak out. Maybe not this generation. Maybe, maybe some over here. Maybe. Um, there's things that we do, right, that, that get us going. And maybe a lot of us here have generationally, generationally learned how to do without because we remember what it's like not to. But this is what their solution was. Go take a walk in a park slowly without anything. Breathe in the smells of this great creation that we have. You might even know this smell just thinking about it. You're walking through like a green belt in your neighborhood and you just cut the grass, right? You breathe that in, and as you do this, you just are thankful for God and what he's done. Maybe you get that nice fall breeze coming in and you smell the trees that are there. My favorite smell is like when it rains for the first time on asphalt here. I know. And you start to slow your brain down. Here's the Christian application. As we do this, if you walk in prayer, thank God for the littlest things. You can do the big ones too. Can you start small? Thank you for giving me today. That I may be a witness to somebody who's lost. Thank you for giving me family, a roof, a job. Thank you for the bird that wakes me up at 5 a.m. every morning because it lights my window chirping. But it's the sound of life. Thank you for the sound of children playing in the nursery that every once in a while bang on the window because it's life. 
and it's joyful. Thank you for the opportunity to sit around the table today and eat food that I may have not prepared. <laughs> and it's warm. And some of it hopefully is still cold. And enjoy that company. <laughs> sit with somebody at a table and get to know them and want to know them, not because I just told you how to, but because you care about them, because they're part of this one thing. You already feel your stress levels coming in. There's too much in this life to worry about. We need to spend more time being grateful. We came up with these grateful blogs um, last week. And we needed to start it with adults first. Because we're not that grateful. Kids find things that are good. Um, but we wanted to teach ourselves so we could teach kids. And the first thing is, is what happened today that I'm proud about? What am I good at? What was really interesting today? Here's the best one, my favorite little one. Out of all of that can go wrong today, what was one thing that I was really grateful for? And you'd be surprised that some people don't have a lot to be grateful for, but what they choose is amazing. They could be the little thing I ate today. And it was good. And I read it, and it came from a kid that is, is homeless. And I was like, man, that is good. I take that for granted. And we share these things. I want you to experience joy no matter what the circumstances are like in, in verse 1. I want you to rejoice in the Lord. Whatever happens, it might be good. It might be out of your control bad. And I don't want you always to think that God is going to use this major, major event to just change your whole entire life. But in it, he might grant you the most comfort you've ever felt. The situation didn't change. The heartache is still there. But you just feel this overwhelming peace. Maybe your situation does change. How awesome. Thank you, God. God is so good. He wants you to have life. And Scripture tells us not just to have it, but have it through Him to the fullest. Let's change our way of thinking. And when we do that, we'll change the gratitude that we have. For Him, knowing you deserve death and you got life. Take your place. Ephesians uh, chapter 3 we're reading today, it says, Now live a life worthy of the calling that you receive. When we leave here, your worthiness looks like this. This was wisdom given to me by Miss Darling. What if we lived a life that reflected the fruits of the Spirit? Fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. With humility in your hearts, we receive each other and we offer these fruits, the world will know who you belong to by the way you love each other. Let's go to God. Now, Father, you're an amazing, awesome God. We don't know what it means truly to be loved so deeply by you. That you would take our place and you would lay down your life. That we would be made free. I pray that we can live a life that just expresses the gratitude and love that we have for you. And I pray that it starts here in our homes, that our children may know how blessed they are because they have parents that love them like the Lord loves them. And give them a deep foundation of who Christ means to their hearts. Whether they receive that fully or not, God, I just pray that we have that heart to live it for them. God, I pray that you help us slow down our lives, that we can take you in deeply instead of just allowing you to bounce off the surface on Sunday for an hour or two. Help us to live lives so deeply rooted with compassion, love, and mercy that it pours out to all those who are with us. And God, help us to focus on the true importance you've given us in Scripture. We love you with everything to love those around us even deeper. Your word tells us that when we offer this love, it covers a multitude of sins. Help us to err inside of it and have a joy that evokes such passion 
and fishing it gives you all the glory for all these things. Paralysis is a big